Open your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 13, as we continue with our series on the life of Moses. And the title of our message today is The Dilemma. The Dilemma. There were several games that I enjoyed playing as a kid, and one was Connect Four. I still like to play it with my kids sometime. You remember the game Connect Four? Yeah. But sometimes in Connect Four, the person you're playing would lay a trap, or, or maybe you might be the one that successfully lays the trap, where no matter which way you go, the game is going to be over. Like this, a classic Connect Four trap. If the yellow, if the yellow coin drops next to block on this side over here, it still loses. Because the red coin just drops and you still have Connect Four. And so... That is a connect four trap. Regardless of which way the yellow goes, the red is just gone. If the yellow goes to block the next one, the connect four, then the red just drops right on top and has the diagonal going up. When? And so that is a great example of a dilemma. A dilemma is when there are two choices, two hopeless options. You could block it, and you still lose, or you could just not block it, and you still lose. It's two hopeless options. Now, I, I feel sorry sometimes for those of us uh, that are English as a second language because we have idioms for this that, that would be hopelessly difficult for people to understand. I love the diversity in our church, and I love the accents, and as Agree was up here, when he, to, when he talked about the, the food, the prices are on the, the, the wall, I got excited for a second. I thought he said there were prizes on the wall. And then I realized he said prices. I don't like prices as well as prizes, agree. But anyway, I, you know, so as... From Mississippi? No, I... Yeah, okay, all right. So, anyway... We have these different idioms, aside from accents, that can make things challenging to understand. Perhaps someone that's in a dilemma might say, I'm in a pickle. For someone in English as a second language, is I'm in a pickle make any sense? No, I mean, you imagine you're in, inside of a pickle? Uh, that, that doesn't make sense. Uh, between a rock and a hard place. How many of you have heard that one? That's believed to have come from a mining dispute uh, over labor and wages. Uh, literally, between a rock working in the mine or a hard place, you know, not being able to afford to feed your family. Between a rock and a hard place. Here's another one between two, two hopeless options. Uh, between the, the hammer and the anvil. Boy, that doesn't sound like a good place to be, huh? Between the hammer and the anvil. Now, for those with a sailing background... And it made it into an old song a number of years ago. There's one called Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea. That's for a dilemma. Now, if you're not familiar with that one, that doesn't really make sense because the devil and the sea. It, the idea was on a ship, a sailing ship made of wood, where your planks that are going up meet your deck, there's a seam that had to constantly be caulked back, you know, in the... 15, 16, 1700s because the caulk material didn't last a super long amount of time. And that seam had to be caulked and because it was such a, a devil to get to, it was called the devil seam. And it ran from the stern. They wasn't actually talking about the devil. It's just it's, it's the devil to get to. It's a phrase. And so if you've ever seen on some of the older movies where a sailor is hanging down on the side of his ship and he's doing something, he's probably caulking the devil seam. So he's literally hanging on the side of the ship just above the water and working on the devil seam. So that was a, another one to represent a dilemma is between the devil and the deep blue sea. Well, here's another one to represent a dilemma for you. 
coming from between the devil and the deep blue sea. What about between Pharaoh, who represented the devil, and the deep red sea? Ah, see, that got us where we're going today. Between the devil and the deep red sea. Here we are in uh, Exodus chapter 13. And so we dig into the Scripture today, Exodus chapter 13. And indeed, it is a dilemma between the devil and the deep red sea. And the Lord, we're in, uh, we're in Exodus 13, verse 21, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way. So, who was leading the way? The Lord was. The Lord went before them in a pillar of cloud to lead the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. If you thought the ability to travel at night time with modern technology and lights was a new invention, no, God was leading the way as a pillar of fire by night so they could travel day and night. Now, who was leading them to where they were going then? It was God. He was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day, which you think about that, you're, you're in the desert and you're being led by a pillar of cloud. A little, little relief from the bright sunshine. It should get chilly at night, dark at night, and, and there's God's abiding presence as a, as a pillar of fire at night. Now drop down to verse 3 of the next chapter, chapter 14. And so, they've been led by God into what would be characterized as a dead end. They have went down between two mountains, a mountain on either side, and uh, there's the Dead Sea. and Not Dead Sea, the Red Sea. The sea rhymes, right? The Red Sea. And uh, there's nowhere to go. And God says, camp here. And it, it probably didn't make sense to some of them. We're on the way to the Promised Land, and we go basically down a cul-de-sac and park for the night. Right? You get the idea. It's a dead end. Well, Pharaoh hears about it. We look here in verse 3. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. So God has led them into a dead end situation. Uh, what becomes very quickly for them as they view it a dilemma. But I want to remind you of something. Anytime you face a dilemma, God has already planned the solution. Amen. Now, the solution could actually be the resurrection. You can end up in a dilemma and it's the end for us here. And the solution may be the resurrection, but ultimately, any dilemma we face, even to that degree, God already has the solution planned. To whatever level you take it to. Now, drop down to verse 9. And it says here in Exodus 14, verse 9. So the Egyptians pursued them. All the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea. Now verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. So what is happening here? Well, Pharaoh's army is coming to maybe kill many of them and retake them as slaves back to Egypt. The only other option is to what? Well, apparently drown in the sea. They are trapped with their backs to the beach, and Pharaoh's army is coming on. What are they going to do? Well, God already has a plan. When you face your dilemma, God already has a plan. He, the dilemma wasn't a surprise to the Lord. Okay, He had led them here. Now, I think of Moses. Our sermon series is on Moses. We're going through the Exodus portion right now. And Moses, Moses knows how to go to the promised land. You realize Moses has fled Egypt before, went to the other side of the desert, and been a shepherd for 40 years. And then Moses knew how to find his way back to Egypt. 
Moses knows the direction to go. And he, as the mediator between God and His people at that time, he is the, the leader that God has appointed and that God is leading, realizes God is leading them down a cul-de-sac. We literally, to get out of here, are going to have to turn around and go back the way we came. And it's the first thing out of the gate. The Passover comes, the firstborn of the Egyptians die, they say, okay, you can go. They leave and go down a dead end street in the wilderness. That wasn't a street, by the way, at all. There were no streets. Moses knows God is leading. Moses has been at this long enough to know God has a plan. But you got to imagine God's going, I mean, Moses is going, boy, I'm interested to see what he does this time. I mean, this just does not, does not look like anything I would have thought to do. And so I, I, I try to think of what was Moses thinking at this point. The people now are crying out to Moses, look, the Egyptians are here. They're going to kill us and take us back to be slaves. And, and Moses is like, yeah, but you know, God didn't send all those plagues and send me over here in the burning bush and all of this you know, for us to die now. So I'm kind of interested to see what he does. Yeah. Well, let's read on. Here's what happens. You know the story, but see, that's what's so challenging sometimes for us is we already know what happens in the story. Can you imagine living the story or at least hearing the story for the first time and you don't know what's about to happen? I mean, you, if you don't know the story, there are people, about two million of them, trapped in a large camp between two mountains. The valley going out is now blocked by a massive army. And behind you is an ocean. A deep red sea. Too wide to swim. Too deep to walk. As you're, let's say you're writing a story, and now you're going to come up with a way to get them out of this. Would it even cross your mind, let's just part the sea? Let's just move the water. No. You say, oh, no, only if you're already familiar with the story. You wouldn't think that. You wouldn't conclude that. You wouldn't derive that if you weren't familiar with the story. That's why this story is just so shocking. And you better believe the people that are standing there looking at Pharaoh's army, turning and looking at the sea, looking at the mountain on either side, feeling rather vulnerable and trapped, are not thinking... God's just going to move the water. But, let's read on. And it says, in Exodus chapter 14 now, verse 13, And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, when I read Moses saying that, I'm like, I'm trying to put myself in the people's spot at that point. Moses is saying, do not be afraid. I think Moses has seen enough to realize God's about to do something. And the people should have, but they're struggling with their faith and, and they're scared. Moses, Moses may not have had the best... He may not have been the best counselor for people that were scared. Have you ever been afraid and someone says, Oh, don't be afraid. I have noticed when my kids, as they've grown up through various ages, and they've been afraid at night, and they've called me into their room, and I say, yeah, don't be afraid. Doesn't fix nothing. You know what they still are? I start to leave the room. Dad, come back. Well, I already told you not to be afraid. Yeah, yeah but I'm still scared. But anyway, Moses started with, don't be afraid. But Moses, I think, was really living in a different reality than the people he was leading at that moment. You've got to remember, Moses, this journey started at a burning bush. And the people had seen enough to believe, but clearly they were struggling. You know, sometimes we can be delivered. Sometimes we can be walking with the Lord. 
Guys, it's pretty clear these people were delivered and literally walking with the Lord. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And yet when faced with something they didn't see an answer to, they are now what? They're scared. Read on. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, for he will accomplish for you today, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see them no more forever. Wow. Verse 14, the Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Now this is an interesting thing. How many Egyptians did the Israelites kill in their revolt and escape from Egypt? Zero. The only Egyptian that died at the hand of an Israelite in an attempted revolt was the one Moses had killed himself 40 years earlier. And of course that revolt totally failed. And this one, although Israel is going to have to fight down the road, they do not fight this battle at all. Read on. Here's what the Scripture begins to, to show us as we look here. We think of, of Moses. We think of him representing Jesus as our ultimate deliverer. We look here in verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. And made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Mm. Now, we don't know today where this crossing was on the Red Sea. Some have tried to suggest it was in a shallow area or this or that, but read on. And it says here in the next passage, in the next verse. Verse 23 of Exodus 14, And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. This is like where if you were watching a movie, you would be like, No, don't do it, don't go. Could you imagine what's going on in the minds of Pharaoh and his soldiers? There was an ocean right there. Now the ocean, there's two oceans. There was one ocean, now there's two. One's on this side, and one's on that side. And it goes way, way up, walls of water. There's no dam there. There's nothing holding that water back except a supernatural unseen hand. All right, let's cross it too. But that's what they did. They had been led into a trap, and they just went right at it. And so, verse 24, now it came to pass in the morning watch. Now you get that? All night the wind blew and they crossed, and now is the morning watch. What is a watch? Well, those were parts of the night. And so, back in ancient times, and I'm sure even in military situations today, some people would monitor what was going on and stay awake while everyone else would sleep. And they just would stay awake for a little while, and then the next one would get up and, and take his spot so he could go sleep. This is the morning watch. This is the last watch of the night that's going to end with daytime. So remember the wind blew at night? This, this picture is of a daytime crossing. After looking for a long time this morning, I tend to do my slides on Saturday morning and work on my content through the week. I guess I was so sleepy that I kept looking for a nighttime crossing of the Red Sea. And then I realized you wouldn't be able to see it. I mean, there would be the, the burning fire thing up in the sky, and that would be good if someone did it, but all the artist pictures have it, you know, where you can actually see it. And so I gave up on finding a biblically accurate picture and used that one. Okay? Wall of water on each side, 
marching across on dry land. So, here it is getting morning time. Verse 24, Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. Did you get that? What did he do to the army of the Egyptians? He he messed with them a little bit. He troubled them. What did he do? Almost like the ultimate practical joker in some ways. Verse 25, and he took off their chariot wheels. Here they are trying to cross the Red Sea. Water on this side, water on that side. As they're in the middle of it, they're thinking, we really need to hurry up. Because that water does not look that stable to me. And then God starts taking off her chariot wheels. Verse 25, And he took off their chariot wheels, so they drove them with difficulty. Yeah, I guess so. You got two wheels, you lose one. Doesn't exactly go into a circle because it's being pulled by a horse. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel. For the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Now, not only had Israel been told, God's going to fight for you, but even before the wall of water comes crashing down, the Egyptians realize, we came all the way here from Egypt. We came all the way here from the capital city and our wheels stayed on and now everybody's wheels are falling off in the middle of this where we kind of get stuck and can't escape. Let us flee. And so... Then it says here in verse 26, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back up on the Egyptians, on their chariots, and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and it goes on and says, not one survived, that their bodies were washed up on the shore and were seen, etc. A little Johnny was in school, and the teacher was a skeptic to the Bible. And somehow or another, as lessons kind of get off track, they ended up talking about the Red Sea. It came up from a student, I think from little Johnny. And the teacher that was a skeptic said, Oh, that, oh, don't take that seriously. The Bible's a fable. And <coughs> though historically, yeah, if they crossed, it would have been in a real shallow area where the water was only six inches deep. Well, the teacher went on explaining, and little Johnny got to look in. And, and little Johnny from the back said, Praise the Lord! The teacher said, Johnny, what is it now? I've already explained to you, they crossed where the water was only six inches deep. It's not a real miracle. He goes, oh, I'm talking about the other miracle. He said, what's that? He goes, it says all the Egyptians were drowned. If they crossed in six inches of water, what a miracle. He drowned all those Egyptians in six inches of water. (laughs) The Bible does mean for us to take what it says literally in stories like this. No doubt about it. And of course, we're thinking of the life of Moses. We're looking at Moses' perspective. And as Moses is doing this, even though I believe that Moses knew God was going to do something, it was going to be okay, he had already been sent by Pharaoh. He had the staff that turned into a snake and then turned back into a staff and the hand that became leprous and you pull it out and then it's not. And he's seen all these plagues fall. He's already, you know, talked to God in the burning bush to begin it all. He knows God's going to do something. I'm thinking Moses was still probably a little overwhelmed himself with how it went down. And so, we examine a few things now. Moses, of course, delivering the people, representing Jesus, leading us out of sin. Uh, The Lamb for the Passover, representing Jesus too. Many parallels there. You know, there are some lessons for us in our lives today right out of this passage, where this ancient text intersects with modern life. One is God sometimes 
right after we start to follow Him, or maybe even, even years later, sometime leads us into apparent dead ends. You know, I thought of a song this week. He makes a way where there is no way. He makes a way where there is no way. Is that what he did with the Red Sea crossing? Was there a way there? Well, if they'd have had, you know, several thousand boats, then there was no way there. But he made a way where there was no way. So, he does this to us as individuals. Uh, There are lessons. Lessons for Israel. No, God wasn't just delivering you from Egypt. He's still going to take care of you. Okay? God is bigger than all the problems you're going to face. That's a lesson. Several lessons for them. It talked about how God was showing the Egyptians something by this. You've got to remember that Pharaoh and his army only represented a small portion of the Egyptians. And their army's not coming home. There is one God. He is sovereign. And they worshipped Pharaoh as a god. Your god's dead. Right? Lessons for the Egyptians. And there's lessons for us. God sometimes leads us into apparent dead-end situations. You may have lost a relationship, may have lost a job, may have lost a property, and it doesn't just have to be in the area of loss. You may feel like the weight of the world or the government or anything else is coming down on you. That you've tried to do what's right, you've tried to follow the Lord, and here you are facing something you can't see through to the other side. And God may have led you into an apparent dead end. And yet, before you come to your crisis, before you realize you have a dilemma... God already has provided a way. Your dilemma was not a surprise for Him. Collectively, this all repeats itself. Now think about that. You had ten plagues. And the first three affected... Everybody. The last four were specific to the Egyptians. The Israelites were protected from those. And so, during those last seven plagues, the Israelites were protected. And when you get down to the end of time and everyone has either the mark of the beast or the seal of God, how many plagues come? Seven. They're called the what plagues? Seven last plagues. To have last plagues, you have to have first plagues. Where were the first plagues? They were in Egypt. They even overlap, have a lot of similarities. Some of them are the same, but on a grander scale, etc. And so, those plagues, just as the original plagues came upon Egypt, as God was getting ready to take His people out of Egypt, these plagues come upon the sinful world as God is preparing to take His people who've been enslaved by sin out of this sinful world. Are you tracking? And uh, without getting into a complete prophecy Bible study today, once everyone has the mark of the beast and the seal of God and the plagues are poured out, the wicked are preparing to destroy those who have the seal of God. The book Great Controversy describes it this way. The people of God, some in prison cells, some hidden in solitary retreats in the forest and mountains, still plead for divine protection, while in every quarter companies of uh, armed men urged on by a host of evil angels, are preparing for the work of death. In other words, about to kill them. About to wipe them out. It is now in the hour of utmost extremity. Now now hold on a second. And this being repeated, collectively, we go through this experience in the future. Plagues have been poured out. What does this compare to? We're standing facing certain death. In other words, we're trapped between the sea and the army right here. Trapped between the sea and the army right here. Same spot. It is now in the hour of utmost extremity that the God of Israel were interposed for the deliverance of His chosen. 
So what are some lessons for us? I mean, this applies to us individually, but it applies to all of us collectively. As we look into the future and believe the Lord is coming soon. One, God can lead us into what looks like a dead end. If you end up in what appears to be a dead end, don't assume God was not leading you. God can lead us. Now, why would He do that? Does He need to show us that He's bigger than our problems? Does He need to build our faith for what's coming? There could be many reasons. Two, Satan won't let you go without a fight. But it's God's fight. Israel had left Egypt after the plagues fell, right? But, Pharaoh comes after him again. Have you turned and walked away from sin and decided to follow the Lord only to feel like the devil's on your back? Yeah. Ask God to fight that battle. Here's another extrapolation for today from the message of Scripture where the ancient text intersects with our life. We've said it before, but it's in the context of our lives and the issues we face now, and the issues we will face in the future, even prophetically speaking, God is larger than our problems. And another one we've said before, but is applicable right here, we need to remember when we face these issues, God has a plan before we know we have a problem. And we think of how God was using Moses to lead His people, how that typified Jesus leading us forward today as we trust in Him and follow His leadership. And so how is it with you today? Where is your faith? Is your faith being tested so that you can grow and be ready for whatever God may be preparing you for? Has God led you to what looks like a dead end? Has God led you to something where you say, I don't see a way out? As pastor, I know we have some people sitting here today that feel that way. And I can assure you, I can tell you, I know from Scripture that God is larger than our problems and He has a plan before we know we have a problem. So put your faith and trust in Him. Ultimately, the parting of the Red Sea becomes a symbol of the resurrection. It's springtime, near Easter, certainly near the Passover, which we were covering the Passover, which was the original Easter weekend two weeks back. And you find that in the New Testament, because the Old Testament kept using the Red Sea and how awesome and mighty God was as a representation of Him and what He does to deliver His people through the Old Testament, you get to the New Testament, you have the death and resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection is symbolized by baptism. And in Romans chapter 10, it says, speaking of this event in the Old Testament, they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Even if the problem is bigger than this life, and sometimes we face medical problems, persecution problems perhaps, that are bigger than this life. The parting of the Red Sea points forward to the resurrection. And even if your problem is big enough, it needs a resurrection. God already has a plan before you know you have a problem. So put your trust and faith in Him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank You that You are bigger than all of our problems. That You are leading and guiding us yet today as Moses guided Israel. And Lord, that before we know we have a problem, You already have a plan. So help us just to more and more each day put our trust and faith in You. If there's someone here today that has not ever accepted You as their Lord, may they do so now. 
and bless us as we continue walking with you, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.